It's uh, my real, uh, my great pleasure and a real great honor to uh, introduce Dr. Fuster, who's uh, been a mentor, a great friend for so many years. Um, so, as many of you know, Dr. Fuster's CV is, uh, would take me literally the whole 59 minutes and 33 seconds to go over all his accomplishments. So uh, instead of just listing one by one all his accomplishments, uh, I just had a couple of slides that I want to show you uh, detailing some of Dr. Fuster's uh, milestones. Uh, Dr. Fuster is from Barcelona. And uh, here he is many years ago when he was, uh, when he was a little boy. And he was uh, in the football team uh, at that time. And of course, we all know what Barcelona is. Can you recognize him in this uh, picture here? Probably not. But in his office, there is uh, this picture with everyone's signature on his birthday a few years ago. So this is uh, his team. Uh, Dr. Fuster was actually a tennis star in Spain many, many years ago. And um, he really thought about going professionally. Uh, and uh, this is what happened. So this is, uh, uh, you know, his alter ego for Dr. Fuster. Again, multiple, uh, multiple signed uh, pictures and uh, other memorandum in his office from Nadal. So uh, this is a person who probably is the most responsible for him not being a tennis star, but uh, really going into medicine. Um, and this is uh, Dr. Fuster's own mentor, who uh, sent him to Edinburgh, uh, where Dr. Fuster really started his journey on understanding uh, myocardial infarction and coronary disease, and how uh, myocardial infarction was really not spasm, but really uh, issues of platelets and inflammation. Um, and uh, his journey went on to Mayo Clinic. He went to Mount Sinai uh, for a little while, came to Mass General where I first met him as a, as a junior resident uh, and then as a fellow. And then I joined him back at Mount Sinai when he came, when returned to Mount Sinai a few years later uh, where he still uh, is the head of the um, Heart Hospital at Mount Sinai and their chief uh, uh, or physician in chief at uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, this is when he came to Sinai uh, and he was recruited there by Richard Gorlin uh, to become uh, an endowed professor and the chief of cardiology in 1982. Uh, in a few years later, he won the Grunzig Award, and this is Dr. Grunzig's wife at that time at the European Society of Cardiology. He is receiving uh, a science award, uh, the highest award for a Spanish-speaking scientist by the Prince of Spain, and now the King of Spain since then. Uh, this is the induction of CINIC. Uh, so Dr. Fuster is not only uh, head of uh, cardiology at Mount Sinai, but he also directs the cardiovascular um, National Cardiovascular Institute, which is the equivalent of the NHLBI in, uh, uh, in Spain. Uh, big focus on uh, young uh, generation of scientists. Here's uh, him with a number of trainees, uh, summer trainees, who keep coming back and uh, evolving in their career. Uh, Dr. Fuster is the only probably living person with his own sesame character, Dr. Rooster who uh, uh, on the Muppets, or at least the Spanish Muppet team, uh, advises on how not to eat too many cookies. Um, he received in 2011 sort of the highest scientific award in, um, in France uh, from the uh, Institut de France. Uh, 2010, his uh, alma mater gave him his, uh, an honorary degree, and this is one of uh, two, you know, 40 degrees that he's received in his lifetime. Uh, this is a very successful ACC annual symposium that he runs over for the last 22 years, and it keeps growing and growing. I'm sure some of you have been there. Uh, he's a super cycler, so 
last few weeks he's been cycling in the Pyrenees and the Alps. Uh, so this is uh, Mont Ventoux, and then uh, on the left side, I think, is the Pyrenees. Uh, just because he has some extra time, he worked on uh, a book with uh, the uh, famous uh, Spanish chef who works on molecular cuisine, Ferran Adria. So here's his book with him. And uh, his, uh, again, uh, last few years, he's uh, taken Jack to completely new heights. And his work on prevention, whether it's in Kenya, uh, Caribbean islands, and more recently, the Familia project on how to target uh, three to five-year-olds in Harlem uh, has been uh, uh, quite uh, uh, amazing. And uh, just because he has a little bit of extra time, he's now a movie star. So uh, this year, The Resilient Heart uh, was, uh, was made about his, uh, his work on uh, prevention around the world and in the US. And uh, it was featured in the Tribeca Film Festival. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Fuster to our meeting. It's, uh, it's a real honor to have him here. And uh, I'm sure at the end of the talk, we're going to all be very inspired. You spend a lot of time. I don't know where you got all these pictures, but anyway. It reminds me something I forgot. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me. This is a great opportunity, and I'm very pleased to be here and to talk to you about an issue that is moving very rapidly. We are all involved with the objective of health, providing health, particularly from the two tools, the scientific tool and the educational tool. And I was asked to talk about the evolution of cardiovascular disease worldwide at the present time. And what I will do is I will be presenting to you what I think is happening and is going to happen in 12 different areas or concepts, which I think are quite exciting. Let me begin by pointing out here on the left of the slide, what is the driving force? Unfortunately, whether we like it or not, is economic. And that is to treat diseases very expensive. And at the present time, there is a significant movement to move to as earlier stages in life to identify people who may develop diseases such as heart failure, of course. Uh, this economic driving has been picked up by NHLBI, and as you probably know, NHLBI about a few months ago considered that understanding health from the molecular, genetic, clinical, social, economic, is a number one priority for the organization in terms of funding. So this is an issue that is quite critical. Now, if we look at the future, I think one of the great problems that I have seen is that we usually talk, we mixed up people at different ages with different disease entities, when in fact, it's quite different to deal with people between age 50 and 100, 25 and 50, and from birth to age 25. In terms of mechanisms of disease, on scientific basis, or even on educational tools if we have to change something. So this uh, has led us to begin to be interested, scientifically speaking, in understanding health. And actually, my presentation today um, um, have some social economic basis, but certainly scientific ones too. Now, basically, what we have done is to move in this direction and I would like to point out, to start with, that the advances in the last few years have been incredible. Surgery, intervention, pharmacology, imaging, genetics, even, uh, even tissue regeneration. So what I'm going to start talking about is what is going on in these areas that are already, in general, the disease begins to be advanced. And then we will move more into these particular aspects. Now, you are in a meeting on heart failure and unloading. Uh, I have followed heart failure for many years. I'm not an expert in the field, but I'm following very closely. And very recently, I had the chance for, for another reason to look at the guidelines of 2013. 
And the guidelines are really very much based on disease that is advanced as it is in the circle. And then I look at heart failure with systolic dysfunction. And, and certainly uh, the, the guidelines are interesting, but something that was quite striking is a paper published a week ago in The Lancet about heart failure, in particular in dilated cardiomyopathy. And I was able to compare what was known in 2013 and what is known in 2017. And it's amazing the advances in this field. Now, if you go into this, you have, well, there are genetic bases for dilated cardiomyopathy, all very complex. A lot has been done in the last five years. Uh, if you go into mechanisms of disease in dilated cardiomyopathy, you know, I thought maybe viral, maybe alcohol, maybe, you know, what we thought in the past. Well, here you have. This is at the present time, we are advancing very much in predicting rhythm disturbances, uh, sudden death versus death and heart failure. And when you look at the, the number of trials just in the last five years, it's amazing. So one becomes overwhelmed by a specialty that is moving so rapidly. And obviously, you end up towards the end of the disease, and you have these devices chronic for chronic uh, assist devices for acute care. And I think you are dealing with a subject which is quite fascinating here in this meeting, which is the subject of unloading. We know very little. I think it's probably important. But uh, then I said, what happened with this so-called uh, normal ejection fraction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? I went in 2013, very little, if you look at the guidelines. Amazing. Now you go now, and it's in a huge situation, a very, very complex entity with many etiologies. You have issues, for example, extravascular. We are now lear learning, and I give a talk tomorrow, about the stiffness of the arteries promoting the generation of the brain and promoting Alzheimer's, for example. We have the problems in the heart, of course, all the aspects of, of volume. We have, excuse me, we have inflammatory process on the right, uh, extracellular matrix in inflammation, and then we have the mitochondria, and the cell is affected. It's very fascinating the changes that have occurred in the last few years in terms of disease. But you know what? We decided to go back and to do our work in saying, can we identify who is going to have the problem? And this is really my moving uh, um, uh, today. And let's me begin by talking about a few aspects that are in people that are evolving with disease. But Maybe we might have been able to prevent it. And I'm going to talk about five different aspects first. Let me go back. 2013, this was not the issue. Today, this is the issue I'm going to be talking about. And that is when things are still not obvious. Well, it's becoming more important in 2017 now, as the guidelines, few things have been added. Now we have here the issue of biomarkers, beginning to use them, not only in the latest stages of the disease in green, but obviously at the beginning, when maybe the patient is at risk to identify such people. Well, there's one issue about the first, uh, the first uh, um, uh, biomarker, as you know, and uh, these natriuretic peptides or VMPs is a stress. What is a stress? Maybe some degree of injury, but certainly appear to play a very important role. And it's a defense mechanism, as you know, when the heart is under stress, hemodynamically speaking. But there are many other causes than stress that makes the test somewhat many times non-specific. But let me focus on the issue of stress and perhaps injury. And here the, we have the most recent approach or recommendations is you should identify people at risk and just measure the VNPs. It's interesting when you look at who are these people, these are the same people that develop coronary artery disease. In fact, three of the seven risk factors are very prominent. Hypertension, diabetes, and obesity affecting the heart in one way or another, systolic, diastolic, 
and so forth. So maybe one should start looking at these people to see what happens with these markers. But we have another marker, perhaps not so uh, known, not so well known to you in the heart failure, but this is a big thing, I can tell you. And these are the troponins. Sure, we have all been talking about troponins with myocardial infarction, it's a degree of injury, but it appears that there is some degree of injury that goes on chronically, which we have to talk about because probably is important, that can identify people who have an injured myocardium by one mechanism or another. The whole issue of uh, the troponins certainly evolved with acute myocardial infarction, and I'm not going to discuss now. And it was an all or nothing. Now with the high sensitive troponins, things are a little bit more complicated. And that is, it depends what algorithm you follow to make the diagnosis. And basically, they are, these, uh, these troponins are measured in a large number of people, they have a measurement, before it was all or nothing. And the question is the change of these measurements, whether it's in one hour, two hours, three hours, is important for the diagnosis of myocardial infarction. This is actually evolving. The FDA has just approved high sensitive troponins in the United States. And the first piece of information is interesting. By looking now at high sensitive troponins in people who came with chest pains, Things are being found later and later and later, which is what I want to focus in the next few minutes. And that is people who actually have levels that are increasing progressively. I think that the first piece of information actually came from the ARIC study as published in 2016. And actually, these were patients who were free of, of uh, coronary artery disease or heart failure were apparently normal. And here you have this, uh, these patients who they measure the, uh, the um, high sensitive troponin uh, twice over a period of six months, and then they follow these patients over a period of, of about a few years, and they look at the events. And it was fascinating, very predictive, particularly when the troponins were reasonably high, not very high, but it was changing. In fact, interestingly, they were able to predict not only coronary artery disease here, but heart failure, and particularly when the raise in the troponins was significant in a large number of patients. And this is actually uh, heart failure, death, and this is coronary artery disease developing in people who actually were apparently normal. In the ARIC study, you know, it's a study of four communities, and these were apparently normal people follow for a number of years. So the issue of troponins is there. The question is what that means. And the question is, troponins, we have a feeling that here is real injury. BNP is a stress, maybe other causes, but here is real injury. And the question is why injury, where is it coming from, then can lead to this data in heart failure. And one of the hypotheses is maybe minor ischemia contributes to heart failure regardless of the mechanisms that then perpetuate heart failure by itself. That's no more than a hypothesis. But this leads to the second interesting study just published, the stability study. Uh, and, and this study actually, you know, uh, was an original study looking at few biomarkers and inhibitors, and the question is, these were patients with a stable coronary artery disease. And they look at whether they were able to predict maize, including heart failure, on patients who had chronic uh, heart disease that was stable by measuring a number of parameters. Well, of the parameters that they mentioned, actually there were two that were very critical, is NT, pro VNP, and high sensitive troponins in patients with chronic disease. And what was fascinating is the tremendous predictability of both. And here you have, just in this case, pro VMP, just see a relationship between the levels. In these patients with chronic stable coronary artery disease, you see the levels, 
and goes up, and here you have maze, cardiovascular death. Hospitalization for heart failure is very significant. This is pro-BNP. The question is why patients with chronic disease develop such pro-BNP. And I would say maybe ischemic heart disease causes an injury that may lead to heart failure. Well, that was the concept that I presented a minute ago. And maybe it's correct because troponins are very high in this same population. So what we are really seeing here is a situation of biomarkers that are beginning to provide us with a lot of light in the interaction between risk factors, coronary artery disease, and, and cardiac failure. And the question is, this is all at the beginning of the processes. And now we have to understand what leads to what? What is the pathophysiology here? Our hypothesis, based on all the data that is evolving on troponins, is there is a lot of minor ischemia going on in people. Maybe the microvasculature. Maybe they are developing heart failure with diabetes, and the microvascular is affected. And this contributes to the process of then beginning to see BNP elevations. It's fascinating, but certainly I think we are in the earlier stages to beginning to grasp an issue or a concept, the role of injury and stress as predictors of what is going to happen eventually on a number of cardiovascular processes, including heart failure. In this particular study, in patients with chronic coronary artery disease, Look, the predictability is amazing, the nt vnp Then you have the troponins, and then you have, they call this ABC, they have uh, five factors. A is H, the V are the two biomarkers, and the C is the diabetes, cigarette smoking, and I think there is another one in peripheral arterial disease. It's just to predict patients who have chronic coronary artery disease in terms of the future, and I wanted to emphasize the issue of heart failure. Well, this is fine, but, and we talk about heart failure, but there are other aspects that really you have to look at the very beginning in the future to see if we can do something about it. And a very interesting one is this one. We thought that a myocardial infarction was a plaque rupture. Well, probably is in 75% of people but most of the ruptures lead to healing of mural thrombus and organization by connective tissue. What was not so apparent until recently, because of imaging, we have learned that actually monocytes type two are the healers here by producing extracellular matrix and, and, and really transforming a lesion that was very small, perhaps the patient may begin to have angina. But the problem is out of 100 ruptures, according to Erling Falk, one leads to this process, a very aggressive process, and the macrophage that takes care of this is a cleaning macrophage with metalloproteinases, cytokines, and so forth, macrophages type one. And this is very interesting because what we are now beginning to learn is that coronary artery disease, from the point of view of inflammation, is a systemic disease. And here you have a plaque that is, is evolving with macrophages type two, and a plaque in the process of myocardial infarction or thrombosis, macrophages type one. That's one aspect. But what about another foreign body? This is cholesterol. The other foreign body is the, is the necrotic tissue. And probably are these two types of macrophages, a destroyer and a healer, that actually lead this heart attack into being larger or smaller depending on the activity of these two types of macrophages. And I have more to say about this in a moment. But this is all going on, uh, I would say, silently in the importance of systemic disease. And you say, where this is coming from? I'm not going to spend the time, but we have been very interested over a number of years to actually image patients during the acute coronary syndromes with PET, positron emission tomography. And you can see the lightning of the spleen and of the bone marrow. This is where all these cells are coming from. And the triggers of these are very complex. And, they, and, they, and what they release, interleukins and so forth, 
is very, very complex. I think in this meeting is going to be presenting a trial into what happened when you block such phenomena that is actually a systemic phenomena. Well, so that's the second concept I wanted to present to you today. The first was the biomarkers, and the, and the second is this particular one uh, related to the systemic process that leads to coronary disease. But there is something else, and you say, I know a lot about intervention, cabbage and, and PCIs. I'm not going to talk about this. But I'm going to reflect for a moment into a third concept. Here you have the syntax trial, and you have the faint trial. The syntax trial, cabbage is better than PCI or stenting in patients with complex coronary artery disease. And the faint trial tells us, don't put a stent unless the lesion you can show ischemia in one way or another. One of the ways to show it is FFR. All of this is fine, but there's an issue here. What about the microcirculation? Who is measuring that? A huge issue, a huge issue. And actually, I'm talking about the heart. Tomorrow, I have a talk about the brain, which is even worse. And I think the question here is the following, is that we are measuring the ischemia here with FFR, but who takes care of this when, in fact, this surface of the microcirculation is 80 times larger than the, epicardial, the surface of the epicardial coronary arteries? And this is evolving very nicely at the present time. I have to say to you, CT is beginning to look at this. MRI is coming out too. And I think this non-invasive technology may be very soon giving us the clue of measuring non-invasively both the type of obstruction at this particular level with FFR or other technologies of measuring the gradients and then measuring the total flow and subtracting to know where the ischemia is coming from. This is the microcirculation, just to give an idea. And now I have 12 reasons to believe the microcirculation is important. It's not part of my talk, but I have one where I got the idea. It's from the Freedom Trial. I was the PI of the Freedom Trial. The Freedom Trial were diabetic patients with coronary artery disease. And they were randomized into surgical intervention, cabbage versus PCI. What was amazing to me is the patients kept coming back with angina, regardless. I'm not talking about the strokes, mortality, and MIs. I'm just talking about angina. And in fact, it was very similar in one group or another. This is cabbage PCI. This is angina. And the patients go to the cath lab, and they open a diagonal branch, a septal branch, and the patients come back and back and back. This is the microcirculation. Typical of the cath labs, recurrence of problems in the patient who has diabetes, for example, and they try to open tiny arteries to see if the angina goes away. We learned this from the freedom type, very, very prevalent. And now I could present to you other pieces of data, but just to emphasize that we have to get into the microcirculation. And in people with heart failure, I have to tell you, you guys have to learn a lot about the microcirculation. There is a lot going on there, which explains some of the aspects of restrictive disease, even congestive heart failure, and so forth. And I cannot get into this, but I just wanted to point out that this is a very fertile field. Well, what I am summarizing is I think the future is going to be the anatomy, and the ischemic of each, the ischemia of each, uh, of each artery and the microcirculation all will be done non-invasively. And this is what I see in less than five years. But what about these three studies? The body trial on, on, uh, on diabetes, the courage trial, the stable patients with coronary disease, and the freedom trial that I just mentioned. I just want to give you a summary of how I see the next 10 years. And the summary is here. What is basically happening is that due to the importance of diabetes, 30% of patients that go to the lab, cabbage is beginning to go up. Most importantly, optimal medical therapy is not medical therapy. Optimal medical therapy and PCI will go down. Now, um, I don't want to proceed to go any further at this point, but just to emphasize that pharmacology, by definition, which is now 
the point number four that I want to mention means the disease is already advanced. I am not sure if we will not be using pharmacology when the lesions are not advanced, but we are beginning to identify them. And what is today very attractive, of course, are the PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, very, very attractive. The dual antiplatelet therapy is an obsession at this time, but just to point out that this is going on at this minute from the pharmacological point of view that is important. But I think it's more important is what is happening in diabetes. For the first time, we already have four trials showing that we can affect macrovascular disease, all in the last two years. And this is uh, just by two types of agents. These agents that actually they, they block the so-called salt glucose absorption, excuse me, in the, in the um, tubules of the kidney. And this one, which is enhancing the receptor of glucagon. These studies are quite fascinating when you look at them in detail. Because here you have death, hospitalization, their myocardial infarction, and a stroke. Here you have three types of studies. And I think it's quite impressive what you see in terms of the results. The most recent study, I think published about a week ago, on the diabetic field, is this one, uh, which is the, uh, the study on canaglyphosine, one of these uh, um, uh, blockers of the receptors in the tubules of the kidney. And these were patients with type 2 diabetes, and they were at high cardiovascular risk. And they really, what they show is what we expected, a significant decrease in cardiovascular events and also mortality. So I think that we are talking about a disease that may lead to heart failure, and we are beginning to, you, we might begin to address it properly, particularly on large arteries, which we will not be able to address it before. And finally, you know very well about heart failure, of, of course, and what I see is so much is going on there in terms of new understanding of mechanisms at the cellular, the molecular level, and so forth, that one can predict that what is in the squares, which are new modalities of treatment, something will come up. And maybe some of these treatments will be used at the beginning when the biomarkers that I mentioned begin to identify that the patients who are actually being troubled. And the final issue of this, uh, of what I'm talking about, is actually the issue of regenerative medicine gene therapy, genetics, and gene editing. I think it's fascinating. Obviously, I'm dealing here, maybe it's at the end of the disease if we talk about uh, regenerative medicine, but maybe we might be talking at the beginning if we look properly. At least with tissue regeneration, as you know, the results are very frustrating. But if you have an open mind, we are learning so much. And therefore, I don't think it's wasted. Perhaps many trials were wasted, too much money involved, but the fact of the matter, we are learning. Look about the induced pluripotent stem cells. With all the pros and cons, this field is advancing very rapidly. The issue of gene therapy associated with this, very exciting. The issue of the products from the cells, not the cells by themselves that tend to disappear, the exosomes, is exciting. The issue of mesenchymal cells, which can become primitive, all of this exciting. But it's also exciting when we are dealing now, beginning to deal with the so-called genetic editing. And the reason why I'm presenting this here is not because we are at the end stage of the disease. We may well be at the very early stages of the disease, not on tissue regeneration, but on the genetic aspects that I just mentioned. Now, I want to move into projects I presented five concepts, different concepts, that I thought you could be interested on, starting with the biomarkers, and then with the micro, uh, the microcirculation, uh, the new pharmacology, the issue that just uh, presented just a minute ago. All these issues are beginning to evolve, and most of them will be at the very early stages of the disease. 
But what about if we have people between age 50 and 100? What are the challenges if we want these people to have good health? The challenges are three. And the first one is adherence to medications. Go back to the freedom trial. We all start from somewhere, from a personal observation many times. At least this has been most of my research. It has been observation, and then you move forward to understand it. We found in the freedom trial something very bad, but probably the most important finding. Only 20% of the patients were properly treated medically. And you say, bad, sure, but as bad as courage in body 2 d we publish this. So with all these technologies, we are not treating the patients on the background problem. And this actually is part of our movement towards the polypill. This is the first polypill approved in the cardiovascular field, which is in 35 countries now over the last year. And now I'm going towards the FDA. And it's fascinating. We found that the adherence improved significantly based on two trials. Uh, in terms of giving a polypill, in these are patients with myocardial infarction, and now uh, next will be on a stroke, aspirin, a statin, and an ACE inhibitor. The question is why 35 countries approve a polypill when, in fact, the only thing that we show is an improvement in adherence? What about events? We don't have data. But they have done economics, and the governments approve because they see that just based on the data of improvement on adherence, they know the number of events that can be prevented and what this means economically. That's how it has been approved in 35 countries, many of them actually here in Europe. But now we are addressing this issue prospectively with these two trials. One of them will be the freedom trial that we are continuing, and that is to randomize patients on the polypill versus all the pills that have to take. One question here. An interesting study that just came out from Dr. Mack et al. They did optimal medical therapy in all these patients that we say with complex disease, bypass surgery is actually better than, uh, than actually PCI. Sure, if you treat the, med the patients appropriately, which we only did in 20%, look what happened. All curves go up. So I think what we are trying to say, this is why at the beginning I mentioned that optimal medical therapy is going to increase very, very rapidly. The other issue that affects the elderly is the brain. And again, we have a separate talk about this, but I'd like to make a few comments. Now, here you have, at the beginning, Novak et al. They point out that Alzheimer's uh, thought that his disease was actually a vascular disease. The next paper that was published in the New England Journal in 2010, they pointed out that Alzheimer's in 80 or 60 to 90 percent of the patients, they have microvascular disease of the brain. Today, we know, actually, that half of them is a disease that I will describe in a moment, and in half is amyloid. Now, was actually the third reference where we work about a few years ago in a study that I will be presenting in a moment, in which we were looking non-invasively large vessel disease, and then by, by a hobby, we were doing MRI, we look at the white matter of the brain. And what we found, there was some correlation between disease in the large arteries, coronary arteries, carotid arteries, iliofemoral arteries, and these lesions that you see in the brain. Well, this evolved so rapidly that just the cardia study showed that in patients with risk factors that are not really taken care of over a period of time, cognitive function is affected. And then we have the next study, number five, five that we can correlate cognitive dysfunction with the lesions that we are showing. What these lesions are, very basically, are occlusions of the tiny microvascular of the brain leading to these lacuna lesions that we saw with MRI, probably causing the so-called dysfunction or cognitive dysfunction. An autopsy of, of, that you see here, reference number six of 1,000 patients, 
the trace factors not being addressed, showing the microvascular disease that we mentioned. In fact, is proliferation of the intima in the arteriolar system. And finally, some hope. Patients over age of 65 in Finland, 1,200 patients with degenerative brain disease, they were randomized into a very aggressive program on risk factor profiling, cognitive therapy, and the other 600 serve as controls. And they show that the process of the disease can be slowed down. So today, and I will show this in a moment, we believe that about 50 to 70% of patients with degenerative brain disease is a disease of the microvasculature related to the risk factors that affect the coronary arteries that has not been taken care of. And these lacuna lesions affect cognitive function. So this actually leads to uh, some of the data that I'm just presenting. And I just want to go over the last two papers which are interesting. Paper number 11, very dramatic. This was just published. Children between age six and 18, obesity. Some of them beginning to have prediabetes. Some of them beginning to have borderline hypertension. Cognitive function measured after 20 years at age 35, 40, affected if the risk factors two are not taken care of or three are not taken care of. A standardized type of cognitive function by the Oxford method are six different approaches in which you already show in young people that the brain can be affected by the risk factors not being taken care of. So it's a huge issue at the present time that we should be quite aware of. The issue of risk factor profile, not only affecting the large arteries, but also the brain. And this is the study that we decided to carry out. It started in New York and now great part is in Madrid. We have a large number of patients with degenerative brain disease that we are looking not only imaging of the brain, but we are looking at imaging of the large arteries to see the correlation. And here we have near 3,000 families of Alzheimer's that we are now screening for what I'm talking about. And it's, in this, uh, it's quite interesting. The data tends to suggest, not our data, the data from other investigators, that Alzheimer obviously is a complex disease, but the progression of Alzheimer's has a lot to do with the vascular component, which about 50% is what I'm describing with the risk factors I mentioned. The rest is the deposition of amyloid in the arteries. And this is the other way around. This actually is finishing this week in which patients who have large artery disease with 3D ultrasound, calcification of the coronary arteries, we then go into the brain to see what is going on. I just wanted to point out that the issue of the brain is extremely important with the risk factors that we mentioned that may cause coronary artery disease and heart failure. And we already mentioned that I believe ischemia, perhaps in the level of the microvasculature, has a lot to do with some of the diseases that you people deal every day in patients with heart failure. The third concept is aging. Now, about aging, I only want to say that this, the data in terms of understanding aging is evolving uh, very rapidly, actually, over the last five years. Not only is an issue of the brain, and that is hedonic, evaluative, uh, or eudonomic, this is actually Hedonic is if you are happy when you go to work every morning. This means if you change emotionally day after day. And this is if your life has an objective long term. This is now being quantified. And we are talking about the relationship between, chronic, uh, between the chronological age and the biological one. And the biological one has a lot to do with these three aspects. The other is the body, the speed of what you walk, how your strength is. The equilibrium, you know, when you go home tonight, there's an issue that is very important in terms of the biology of aging, is the relationship with the equilibrium and the vestibular system. You use one leg up, you close your eyes, and if you are, a, or if you are close to age 80, you should have more than five seconds that you don't fall apart. If you are age 60, it should be more than 10 seconds. If you are better than age 50, it should be more than 15 seconds that you stand up like that. 
I was one second. <laughs> Don't believe it. I have done it, and not too bad, actually. The next question and is the issue of genetics. It's fascinating. There are at least 130 genes that have been identified that could work on aging. And one of the most interesting aspects, actually, that is, is uh, worth mentioning is the issue of the telomeres. This is very fancy, but probably we have the largest study done with fresh blood ever in Madrid with 1,000 people that we are following year after year uh, in a bank, uh, uh, the people who work in Bank of Santander. And basically, there is no question that the telomere, uh, whatever is doing, supplying genes that are lost during, uh, during proliferation, certainly gets shorter and shorter with age. And here's the issue. Aging has a lot to do with the defense mechanism. And that is, you can imagine that if your telomere is short and you, need a, you have an infection and you have the white cells proliferating and genetically are not capable, the problem is significant. What is perhaps most striking today is the data that is evolving, that the telomeres may get shorter by oxidative stress with same risk factors that may affect the large coronary arteries in the microvascular of the brain. Oxidative stress of smoking, oxidative stress of obesity, oxidative stress of sedentary life. So just to point out today that we are living in a society that is affecting the heart, the brain, the generative brain disease, and perhaps the biological aging. And this leads to one of the most important topics that we are working today, which is can we identify by imaging in people between age 25 and 50 who is developing the disease and doesn't know? Again, all the projects have this early stage of an approach. Well, we have done 12,000 patients in three studies, and I can only do now is to summarize them. Two technologies. One is 3D ultrasound, in which we can measure by the device that moves automatically in the carotid system and in the iliofemoral system the cubic millimeters of disease in the main arteries. So we can quantify atherosclerotic disease non-invasively and calcification of the coronary arteries on the right. Study number one, the HRP study near 6,000 patients, not patients, these were individuals without disease, and they were in the Florida and in the Chicago area. What we found is that in the horizontal axis is more and more carotid focal disease, and this is more and more calcification. The burden of disease, more predictive than Framingham, of the 216 patients who have heart events over a period of three years. So obviously, when you have burden of disease, you are already identifying somebody at high risk. Where Framingham, you don't know what is the smoker or who is the smoker developing the disease or not. The importance of looking at this from the point of view of subclinically with imaging. We have two papers in the New England Journal which were quite fascinating, one in December and the other is two, three weeks ago which is basically, for, we pulled together four studies very similar than this one. And the question that we addressed was, is what is affecting the coronary arteries, the risk factors I mentioned, or the genetics? 50 genes were identified, and from them we call a high gene profile when there were mutations of more than five genes of the 50. And then we had a high profile of risk factors. Interestingly, the high profile of, risk of, of genes, certainly these are events in the follow-up and progression of disease, and this is risk factor, no connection, except diabetes type one and familial hypercholesterolemia. The main two points of interest. The first point is that people who have a high genetic risk factor profile, if they take care of the risk factors that almost everybody has, it drops into half the number of events. So there is no excuse to just have a genetic disorder affecting the coronary arteries. And the second is the paper that was actually published about a couple of weeks ago, which is fascinating. One of the mutations being found is the TET2, which is TET2 is fascinating because 
is a breaker of the macrophage type 2 that I mentioned to you before is very aggressive in the acute coronary syndromes. If there is a mutation of that, probably this enhances the disease. And this is the interpretation of the data. So just to say to you that this imaging technological approach that we are taking is providing us with a lot of interesting information. And here there is the second study in Madrid, 6,000 people. Why we went to Madrid? Because the other people that we screened were over age of 60, 65, and when we told who had the disease, they didn't change their behavior. We think young people would, so we went into a much younger population. And this much younger population showed the following. At age 50, we already can show focal disease in 75% of, uh, of men and in 50% of women, three, four, five, or six of the regions. Remember, we do 3D ultrasound of two carotids, two iliofemorals, and the main aorta. And then we do calcification of the coronary arteries. So the disease, as the pathology said many years ago, starts at a young age and is very, very universal. The question is, if one has a high burden of disease, as we are quantifying by, by uh, cubic millimeters, then we should act much more aggressively. This is something that uh, we are working in developing countries, and the question is, do we need cholesterol in blood sugar? We don't. If you get the seven risk factors of, of, of cardiovascular disease and you exclude cholesterol and blood sugar, all what we do is we compare, and you see in the top, this is the group of people in which we took all the, the data with all the seven risk factors, and here we excluded blood sugar and cholesterol. And here is the risk in the, uh, in the ordinate axis. I don't have to go into the details, but what that means, if somebody's obese, the cholesterol is high, the blood sugar is high, it all goes together. And when you pull a formula with all the risk factors, you realize that those two do not play a very important role. So in a developing country, in 10 minutes, they can, they can see a patient have the five risk factors and find out where we stand in terms of risk. And this, economically speaking, is very, very important. And this is the third study in General Motors, 2,000 people, all the imaging technology I mentioned. Here, the only thing what we did is we did a formula that includes Framingham, includes the focal disease with 3D ultrasound, and includes the, uh, um, the uh, calcification of the coronary arteries and the risk factor profile. So these studies are being followed, and actually the first study, the HRP, will have a 10-year follow-up in about three months. And the studies are associated with genetics, omics, and associated with everything I presented to you before. So we are really going into identifying people in much earlier stage through imaging technology and see actually what we can learn. Can you change the behavior of these people? I will tell you, very difficult. But we have two clues, and these are the two studies I mentioned here. The first clue is actually came from Kenya. We went to Kenya because in a poor part of Kenya, they have high blood pressure because they keep the food with salt. So what we did is we distributed blood pressure machines to the people in the street with one of my uh, colleagues, Rajesh Bedanton. And then they, these, these people got motivated. They measured the pressures of the neighbors, and they actually put all this together in an in intelligent phone. So it's a fantastic registry of blood pressure. So showing, when we go there, it's amazing. Everybody talks about blood pressure, the impact that you can have in a community with a particular risk factor profile. But perhaps the most important study that we have done in this regard has to do with something similar to Alcohol Anonymous. We started in the island of Granada. We went to the town of my wife in Cardona, Spain. And then we did a study in Spain uh, that was supported by the government in all these communities that you see here, in which basically, like Alcohol Anonymous, we put people together, 10, 15 people, they meet every month, and there what they deal is not alcohol. Obesity, blood pressure, cigarette smoking exercise, you smoke, I will help you, you help me. It's a peer pressure. And the leader of each group has to be in trouble. We found that leadership 
nothing better in this regard if it is somebody in trouble too with the risk factors, not to put somebody who is perfect. It just doesn't work. And this is something that we are learning. So community work is so critically important that we are now learning something. Children listen, adults we do not. But if we work in community, we may become motivated and take care of our health at an earlier stage. And this leads to the work we are doing in children. It's probably one of the largest studies that we are actually involved. And the rationale is the following. At early age, between age two, three, four, five, six, the number of centers of the brain is very small, and they do not connect well with each other. So whatever you tell a child stores this and comes back later. We learned this with Sesame Street. I have been the medical advisor for many years. And that is our behavior as adults has a lot to do with the environment that we learned when we were children. However, when you get puberty, the, the centers begin to connect and, and it's a mess. The hormones and everything, you tell your children what to do, they don't listen, they are confused. So why we don't go into this group of population and we tell health is a priority? And this is actually what we did. We told these children, first in Colombia, then in Spain, and then in other countries, and here in New York, how the body works, healthy food habits, uh, physical activity, and how to control the emotions, preparing them when they receive in the future alcohol, smoking, drugs, and so forth. 70 hours of teaching over six months. This is a very aggressive enterprise. The teachers have to be very passionate in the school system, and that's what we did. The results were fascinating. We followed these children for three years, and the attitude, knowledge, and so forth was extremely better. In the group, these were randomized studies who were intervened versus those who didn't. This project has had a significant success. So now we are dealing with 50,000 children, starting education at different ages. We are convinced that to prevent cardiovascular disease, we have to go to childhood. This is actually the bottom line or the message that I would like to leave today here. And this is actually what we are learning. Here I am teaching 1,000 children in a school in Madrid. And what is interesting, look how the attention of these children when you talk to them about health. 70 hours over a period of six months. And this finally leads to the following. Everything I presented to you today, particularly when we talk from here down, is now being applied in towns, in groups, in communities. And we started actually with Harlem. And the Harlem study is basically 600 families that we are applying what I told you. The children and the parents, we do imaging, we do genetics of the children with the saliva of the parents. We are really moving on in trying to see what we are dealing on and how can we change behavior, even in a poor socioeconomic area like Harlem in New York. The study is going up very, very nicely. And then, why not? We ended up in the town of my wife, where many of these projects started, and we are trying to make this a healthy town. With everything I presented to you here, all the projects are going on. There are a lot of excitement. Studies are randomized. We are comparing with another town that is similar, and we are not intervening. Both towns are of 5,000 people. Both towns are mining towns. So social economically are the same. All the studies I'm presenting are all randomized. You should know that. There's no study that has been done just descriptively. So in this, uh, finally leads to the question of where we are going here. What we are doing is, as I'm presenting to you today, is the developing concepts. And the concepts that we have developed actually started from children. We went in the reverse of what my presentation has been. And we did children, adults, he is the family, and now we have all these projects that were picked up by the government of Mexico the Minister of Health, and we are doing this in Mexico, and the, the Peru, they want us to start the projects, but I have a problem. Governments change every week, and therefore, I am beginning to move more into NPOs, and that is a stable 
groups that can pick up the project, and at least what we can do, we don't have the manpower, is to look at the quality of what is being done. And this is basically the approach that we are taking. I'd just like to finish by saying to you, <clears throat> and this is just for you, this is, I, am, I, am, I have been working first in the basic laboratory experimentally, so I have been a rat in the street from the beginning, and I'm still now working just not myself but people around in terms of the same issues at the molecular level, at the experimental level, at the clinical level. But I realize that the bottom line is to prevent disease, and the bottom line is to promote health. This is why we are putting so much effort into it. And it's interesting why I was picked up as the chair actually to advise the government of the United States of what the United States should do in, in global health. I have a meeting on a year, I am the co-chair, and I present this in Congress next month, and there's a paper coming in the New England Journal of the summary of this. But it's a very interesting situation, and I think the concept is the following. When you feel passionate about something, things work. I don't know why I'm in these committees, but the reality is because I feel very, very strong that we should identify disease very early, and then we should put all of our efforts on that rather than in ourselves. So I just finish by saying to you that my approach today is you are in a meeting here of unloading in heart failure. I think it's fascinating. And there is certainly a lot going on in these particular areas. But even there, we have a lot to do in the earlier stages. And then I think we have to move. Uh, this is disease entities. Here we have to move in terms of age uh, younger and younger. And I think at least we have a roadmap that, at least in my view, it makes sense. Uh, Roger and others, thank you very much for your attention in inviting me today. Thank you.